welcome on a very, very special guest. It's Dr. Carl Hart. Dr. Carl Hart is a, uh, you're a doctor. You've uh, known, you're known for your research on drug abuse and drug addiction. You're a neuroscientist and a psychologist. Is that correct? That's right. Any other credentials I'm, I'm leaving out? Doesn't really matter. I'm a father. I'm a taxpayer. <laughs> I like uh, it. <laughs> You know, whatever. Thank you for your service. Yeah, and that's like, <laughs> that's a, you know, that be, that has become like a, just a throwaway line, you know, like, thank you for your service. Yeah. Uh, I did serve. But, oh. You know, really, I didn't, um, I wasn't in any war, and I was a uh, military police for a little bit, which is a bullshit duty. Uh, and I was also <laughs> supply. So when people say thank you for your service, um, um, I don't I don't I don't think they really know what they're saying and it just becomes this nothing line. I was saying it because you said you were a taxpayer. Oh. I didn't know that you served <laughs> right on. I, I didn't know that you served in the military. Right I was on. saying thank you for, for right contributing. On. Right on. Proud well, to be a taxpayer. That's there we go. Something I'm most proud of. <laughs> All right. All right. Right. Uh so yeah, it's it's great to have you on. We've we've talked about some of your work before on the show. Um you are, are known for uh, your your opinions and your studies and uh, your... Not my opinions. Your, your uh, uh, as a scientist, you know, the evidence drives uh, what I think. That's a, it's a big difference. I know we got mm -hmm. this podcast era where everybody just kind of shares their bullshit, but this ain't the same thing here. This is... Facts? Facts, based on the scientific literature. Right? Okay. Yeah. Well, you're known for your extensive work in that field. Yeah. And and I, I guess I have heard uh, some interviews with you where, where you've reached your conclusions from the studies that you've done. And you're saying that these are the correct policies that we should be advocating for and the facts bear those types of things out. So um, actually, let's just like let's back it up a little bit. Um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, where you come from, how you got interested in, in this field of study? Yeah. So, you know, I grew up in the 70s, the 80s, um, grew up in Miami. Um, in the mid 80s, I was in the military and the mid 80s, the country thought crack cocaine was destroying communities like the one which one which I come from. And so uh, I thought, well, how can I make a contribution? And one of the ways I figured that I can make a contribution is to study neuroscience and study how uh, the brain uh, responds to cocaine. If I could figure out um, that maybe I could develop treatments to help people struggling with crack addiction. And then I could help uh, clean up some of the problems in my community that I thought was related to crack. And so I began studying um, 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 neuroscience and, um, uh, and here we are 30 something years later. Um, of course, I have a different perspective than when I started. I thought the problems were related to crack, but the problems were the same sort of thing employment, mm -hmm. uneducation, poor health care, all the same problems that are here today. Like we said, the problems were were crack and people still believe this dumb shit. And <laughs> crack is gone, but the problems are still here and people still believe this nonsense. Mm -hmm. so, so what's interesting to me is um, one of the studies that you uh, conducted, it took, and for people that don't know, it took uh, drug users and, and you, and if I'm, fucking it up uh, you know excuse me correct me but you took drug users and you incentivized or, or you you juxtaposed a more attractive um uh, i guess uh so not solution but an attractive substance which i mean money could be concluded as that uh and you juxtaposed that with the substance of choice of theirs and you and you found i, I don't want to you know, mischaracterize your study. So what what, what was your results well, from that's that That's a great, great point. So uh, that was a study published about 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And the idea was kind of simple. We uh, People were saying that, okay, if someone is, has a crack cocaine use disorder, which I mean addiction, um, they would only choose crack if you gave them that choice, like mm -hmm. a nice hit of crack versus something else. And we had another alternative. As you point out, it was something as little as $5. And what we found was that they chose money on about half of the occasions. Mm -hmm. And then when you increase the amount of money, they almost never choose crack. And so it just tells you that uh, dr drug users 
can and do respond just as rationally as anybody else. Mm. And their behavior is, is sensitive to the same contingencies as anybody's behavior. Right. Um, and so it just went against uh, the things that we were saying about the power of crack. Right. And so I, what's fascinating to me, because I have I have these conversations a lot. So I'm like I'm an advocate for the decriminalization of all drugs. And, you know, I get a lot of pushback from that just from the, the shock value of, oh, my God, you want druggies walking the street. And I'm like, well, we already have that. And so, like, we, we need to find out other solutions. Um, and one of the pushbacks I get is one of my homegirls who's a, a therapist who's a little more on the conservative side. Uh, we were having a discussion about this recently. Um, and she was she brought up the point which uh, I would love to hear your perspective on, which, you know, I vehemently combated. But I would just like to hear your perspective on it. Um, so I can show to her later, but uh, <laughs> she she was bringing up the point because she deals with drug abusers and drug users and and people of all walks of life. And so she was saying, if you decriminalize it, you're you'd have to deal with the fact that you are actually incentivizing drug use. Like, what do you say to people who, you know, posit that as a, as a byproduct? Yeah, you know, it's a lot to say. It's really um a dumb low level sort of perspective in in that uh, first of all you have to ask people to step back the illicit drug trade is a multi billion dollar industry mm -hmm. so the people who are supporting this industry they have loot they are the important people in our society otherwise the industry couldn't can survive right. it's not poor people it's not the people who don't have jobs these folks have jobs and resources mm -hmm. uh, my last book drug use for grown ups went around the world, got high with people in Brazil, the Philippines, uh, Br Barcelona, all over the world, just to see and, and show people like how this thing really goes down. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like I go to work every day. I pay my taxes. I'm a drug user, you mm -hmm. know. And so um, and then there are far more people like me in the world, right. but they're in the closet. Right. Today, uh, it's OK to say, Oh, yeah, I experiment with psychedelics, some bullshit like that. Right. And then you disparage somebody who uses heroin or crack when you're doing the same thing. Right. And so the thing that I try to help people to understand is that it's already happening and it ain't the people that you think it is right. who are doing this. That's one. And two, if you say you're an American, you should know the founding document permits us to do this. Uh, the Declaration of Independence says that we all have this life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, mm -hmm. those three birthrights. If that's the case, it means we can live our life like we choose, so long as we don't prevent others from doing the same. Right. Um, and that's what it means to be American, fighting for other people's rights. So right. when we talk about patriotism, it means you're fighting for other people's rights. And so this nonsense about telling people how to live their life when they're not bothering anyone um, I don't understand why Americans don't really respond uh, aggressively against such uh, paternalism. Right. It's it's an infringement of liberty at, at the bottom line. It's, a French, it's an infringement of liberty, my right to pursue my happiness as I see fit. You know, all of these sort of fundamental things that libertarians claim to care about, Republicans claim to care about. Democrats claim to care about, and it's like, it's bullshit. And, and I don't understand why we, as a nation, don't just call bullshit on this. Yeah, I, I think that there's, you have to have your head buried in the sand if you think that the war on drugs has been anything but an abject failure. Yeah. No, we, hold up, it's been a success. That's <laughs> yeah, why it continues. Okay. Yeah. There are a lot of people making mad loot on the war on drugs, mm -hmm. people who, Claim to be providing treatment. Many of those people are making mad loose. Uh, we all know about the law enforcement. We, uh, you know, you think about, I think about the derailment in Ohio, those poor people with the train. Those kind of places, the rust belt of America, jobs left, the factories left. The only thing you have is the war on drugs economy. And so many of those people are like law enforcement and they are and now with this sort of fentanyl scare, uh, we're uh, feeding into that and, and and creating jobs related to that. Not to deal with the issue, mm -hmm. but just creating jobs related to that. From the issue that we were told at the start of the war on drugs, which was we're going to get drugs out of America, we're going to clean up the streets, all that stuff. 
that part has been a failure. That the what they told us that the war on drugs is going to be about has not ended up working out not even one percent of what they thought it was going to be i was i was talking to big t about this uh a couple weeks ago because big t does he stands more on the republican side of things but if you just even take a look at what we've done to enforce the war on drugs not in our own borders but if we're talking about central america south america the governments that we've destabilized down there intentionally to get our people in place that's caused a lot of the immigration that's come to this country that now people are like against having those countries send their immigrants to us. But it's because of what our actions that we've taken overseas or south of our borders that have actually caused a lot that this should be something that I think more people should we should figure out a better solution to because right now and I know that sometimes it's not always about like the solution that I think would be the correct solution. You're an advocate for for legalized drug use. Um, I do have a couple questions that we can get to about this that. Is, this is more than drugs. This is bigger than drugs. This is about people's right to live their life as they see fit so long as they don't disrupt other people. This is about abortion, uh, bodily autonomy, all of these things. So this is just trying to get people to live up to the american ideals that they are spouse that's it all that's right. what that's this is about i got you so let's let's talk you brought up fentanyl uh fentanyl has been in the news a lot last year or two it's really it's it, it to me seems like a uh a cheat code almost for newspapers out there if, if they want to get people to read their articles they'll write another article about how deadly fentanyl is and, and make no mistake like fentanyl can kill you and it does kill a lot of people unfortunately uh, but in terms of the scare that's going, can you tell us from your studies that you've you've conducted and that you've looked at, is there any day if I had if I had a, a bag of fentanyl in this room and I just opened it up, would any of us in this room be in danger just by being in that same room? No. So I should take a step back. People should understand that fentanyl has been an FDA, FDA approved drugged for about 50 years. So it's an improved medication. Uh, in fact, my nephew had cancer. Um, and so he was given fentanyl. I mean, fentanyl comes in a lollipop pre uh, preparation for in some cases. So it's a safe drug when people know what they have. Um, now fentanyl, the thing that concerns me is that if people think they have heroin and they have fentanyl, so that uh, fentanyl is a lot more potent, meaning that it takes smaller amounts of fentanyl to produce an effect. So if you think you have heroin, you might, uh, I don't know, snort a larger line or inject a larger amount thinking that you have heroin when in fact it's fentanyl. And then you've taken a really large dose of fentanyl and then you might run the risk of overdosing. But if you know you have fentanyl and you scale back, it's not a big deal. And this notion of, oh, fentanyl is in the room, you might breathe it or uh, that's some cop propaganda bullshit that they use in order to frighten the public and increase their budgets. And this continues to happen and the American people keep falling for it. And, and so I don't even know if, um, if people um, um, even care if it's true or not. I think they, it's a way to support the cops or support those people who just say they're going after drugs. They need a new tank for their local police department. So they're like, there's a scary new drug that's out there. A new tank, increased budgets, you name it. Yeah. You know, and, and by the way, and I don't want to hate against anybody for like having a job because you want people to be employed, but you don't want people's employment to be based on the subjugation of other people. Mm. Mm -hmm. All right. So you talked earlier about traveling to different countries, taking different drugs to different people around the world. What are, what are the best experiences that you've had in those travels? Oh, so right now I live between New York and Geneva because I can't live in the U.S. full time because of this fucking hypocrisy. So <laughs> when we think about like the best experiences I have, I mean, my experiences are very great experiences for me is being altered in Geneva, in my Geneva apartment and writing. Um, and I live next to a park and walking in the park late at night, nobody's there. It's a city of 200,000. Nobody messes with me. I just chill in my head, creating things that I write. And that's, those are the best experiences for me alone. That's cool. That's very good. What about, uh, you mentioned South America. 
ayahuasca has been a, a point of discussion recently. Have you ever, have you tried ayahuasca? No, I haven't done ayahuasca. I've done uh, uh, just DMT, the major comp component, but, but not ayahuasca itself. Uh, you, you know, I'm really happy that people are having these experiences um, and um, they're, they're talking about them. The thing that worries me about this old psychedelic sort of renaissance, if you will, is that they don't realize that they're altering their consciousness, just like somebody smoking crack, just like somebody using heroin. And they're all seeking the same thing. Somebody might be talking about God. Other people be talking about relief from you, motherfucker, whatever. But it's the <laughs> same thing. They're all seeking the same thing and they just use different languages. And we're, we're figuring out a way to use psychedelics to uh, actually um, uh, create even more barriers between people. And if anybody's ever like really gotten high and really thought about things, how can you think about separating yourself from other people as opposed to seeing how you are connected to other people? That's what this is really all about. So I think that's kind of like a, uh, an advocate though. I think if if we want to change things, we have to change like the social fabric and the social consciousness, right? And so I, I don't necessarily view the psychedelic renaissance as you coined as a bad thing. I, I look at it more like, okay, people are starting to become more open to the fact. Like even, you know, weed is starting to get, you know, legalized at local levels and in certain places and pockets. Um so I don't necessarily view it as as a as a bad thing. Yeah, I don't. I, I'm, I, it doesn't have to be a bad thing. It's right. just unfortunate. It's playing out like a bad thing. Right. I'll give you an example. People say stupid shit like, "Oh, I'm doing plant medicine," uh, stuff okay. like that. Yeah. Don't you know the ultimate original plant medicine is the opium poppy? Yeah. Uh, you know where heroin and morphine come from, but yet they don't think of these drugs yeah. in that way. All the drugs that we take come from plants. I mean, that's what this is about. So when people are doing, no, they're, they're using this language to uh, create divisions. I, one, think about, let's think about ketamine. Ketamine is based on just uh, altering the PCP structure. Mm -hmm. They produce very similar effects. PCP's effects last a little longer. The public narratives surrounding both of those drugs are wildly different. Right. I mean, belief narratives drive PCP sort of story, and we believe these crazy, this crazy nonsense. When in fact, the, the drugs are quite similar. similar. Yeah. And oh, think about MDMA. I, on my shirt, I have methamphetamine. This is the methamphetamine structure. You add a little ring here, you be it becomes MDMA. Mm. Um, they produce a lot of the similar fact effects. They have d uh, divergent effects as well, but the narrative surrounding these drugs wildly different. So I, th I think one of the big pushbacks I get from when, because I'm, I'm, I have a very similar train of thought as you, obviously not as well versed in the sciences behind it, but you know I read what I can uh, and then develop my worldview accordingly. Um, but I think one of the biggest pushbacks I get from people is that um they're one they fallen for the boogeyman of, of 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 people who use drugs are just these you know drooling people that just want to rob and create havoc right when it's obviously not the case if you've been around it but i think the the other narrative that that people fall for i always have to combat is um i think people um in general want to um stigmatize drug users in in that same in that same box um and how how have you found or how how do you have you how do you convince a public that has a an idea of what drug users are versus what it can be because i, I think there's a regulatory aspect of of the decriminalization of drugs that has to that has to have uh any kind of balance in that situation. So how have you found like that aspect of it versus, you know, your own ideas of, of how to regulate if we do ever come to that point where we do decriminalize it? Yeah, man, that's, that's a good question. You know, you're, you're asking a question like, um, how do you like um, help people to understand, continue in this fight um, and bring people along who, um, might not yet get it, but will get it, you know, and so how do you, you be patient and those kind of, it's a very difficult question because, you know, 
Uh, I'm 57 this year, and I've been doing this for more than 30 years, and you get tired. Uh, yeah, that's uh, the vibe I'm getting. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So I, I'm very tired. And, and then I try and think about, like, other struggles in the country where people have uh, just looked to the Declaration of Independence. I think about the, the, the struggle for sexual equality. I think about homosexuality, all of these kind of things. And they, people were just saying, we just want to enjoy our rights. That's mm. it. You know, and then it took the society a long time to get there. You know, even like uh, we disparaged uh, people who were gay and we imprisoned them and did all of these sort of things. Uh, and all, and, and now we recognize their humanity. It's, it's not like they didn't always have humanity, but we only recognize them. So it's like, when we think about drugs, will it take that long? Will it be that? And so I, I try to, I try to write. I'm writing things. I try to do these kind of things. Um, uh, when I would much prefer to be in my Geneva par apartment chilling. And so I'm trying to, uh, trying to stay connected. I'm trying, I'm trying to continue to write. I have children who they have to see me fighting, so they have a model of what it looks like, mm -hmm. you know, and although I would really love to retreat, but I can't because I think of my kids and their struggle, and that's just part of life. So I, I keep going. Some days are better than others, mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I'm a human, and, and you know, I've heard all the arguments, all the dumb shit, and, uh, but the thing that I just try and get Americans to understand is that what it really means to be American. It means that, like we say this bullshit, like we're the freest country in the world, mm -hmm. in part because of the Declaration of Independence, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Like almost every democratic nation now has some wording related to that. Mm -hmm. Even Russia has some, uh, and so we try, I'm trying to get people to understand like, is this just virtue signaling or mm -hmm. is it real? Uh, can we make our promise, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, match our practice? That's mm -hmm. it's, So I try and keep it as basic as that. So they will have all of these arguments. What about these people who are on drugs and harming people? We have laws against harming people. You can't do that. We already have laws about right. that. Right. Uh, when the, So the vast majority of people who take drugs are not harming people. So... Right. Do you want to harm them or do you want to suspend this promise? You, you know, so I try and get people to think about just the basics. Right. It's like, uh, are you who you claim to be? Yeah, uh, I, I, it sounds to me like you're you're advocating from the standpoint of uh, it's not the government's responsibility to tell you what you can or cannot put in your body. And that's a very like even platform that you have. That's you don't waver Should be from bipartisan. that. You don't waver yeah. from that whatsoever. Because when I when I was talking to Arian about legalization, I would my concern was going to be that uh, yeah you can if you have heroin that's available at a CVS, you go and it's it's very it's easier to overdose on heroin than if you don't know what you're doing than it would be for somebody to go in and you know buy a bunch of alcohol and overdose on that. I feel like the it would be more dangerous as a whole. But what you're saying, you're not talking about um, about any of that. You're saying like across the board, that's society's problem that we need to educate people about what's dangerous, what's not. It's not the government's place to step in and do that. Is that a fair characterization? I, I, absolutely. I mean, like what alcohol, every year, 100,000 Americans will lose, lose their life related to alcohol. Um, uh, a lot of that will be alcohol withdrawal, people abruptly discontinuing alcohol use, thinking that they're doing the right thing and alcohol withdrawal uh, can be deadly. Uh, like heroin withdrawal is not deadly typically, but alcohol withdrawal is. Uh, and, and so we don't ban alcohol because of that. What we try to do is we try to educate people. We try to make sure that we sell it in unit doses such that people don't harm themselves. We can sell heroin in unit, unit doses that will decrease the likelihood of people harming themselves. We can have a requirement before you purchase heroin like we have with the driving in this country. You have to pass a driving test. You have to be a certain age. Every year, 40,000 Americans will lose their life on our highways 
we don't ban cars. We just try to make sure that we make it as safe as possible. Right. Speed limits, brakes, um, uh, all of these things, training people how to drive. Yeah, you know, D uh, Dan Rather did heroin on the air one time. That's a fascinating story to me. It was that. back in the 70s, I, I believe, God, look at that. when he was on the radio as a journalist, he wanted to describe what this drug was that was, uh, I guess, was affecting a lot of people returning from I Vietnam. I didn't know this. Yeah, so he, he under the supervision of a sheriff, he oh my God, put himself that... in a recording booth. Why, why the supervision of a sheriff? <laughs> <laughs> it should be a doctor. Uh, right? yeah, I, I was just about ready to like be like, man, I probably be you, Dan, but a sheriff. If, what if you get too high, I'm going to arrest you. <laughs> <laughs> no, but he described kind of what he was going through, and it's 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 fascinating if you go back and you listen to it. Uh, I think there's also transcriptions that you can read on it. But yeah, uh, squeaky clean, Dan Rather, Mr. News, yeah. shot up heroin. So just to, uh, to put a stamp on that point, um, so William Burroughs, do you guys know William Burroughs? The name's familiar, familiar but... Yeah. Well, he's like the guy, he was a writer and people, he was a, a heroin addict and, and the public uh, uh, respected him and liked him. And so he, his description of heroin use became the national description. And so we have these sort of ideas about people who use heroin and it's largely wrong based on that kind of stuff. So I just wanted to, like people have these notions about people who use heroin, but uh, if you've had a toothache and you've been prescribed something like uh, Percocet, you've had the heroin equivalent. So it's not all of this sort of drama that we see in, in, in the film. That's one of my major points to people is that, cause they're like, cause they're, they're super like, well, heroin's so addictive and, we, and I'm like, fam, it's possible to do heroin and not be super addicted, but just enjoy your day, right? Because I, I, I used to play ball, right? And so I've had over 14 surgeries. And yeah, so no, I, I, you were one of my main heroes. I, I was running back too from, okay. uh, from Miami. So, okay, okay. you know, Miami football religion. So I, I know I know a little bit about your story. Thanks, much love. And mad props to you. Much love, much love. So one of the, one of the things that um, uh, I had after every surgery was morphine, right? Yeah. And so they would give me morphine, and it was just one of the best feelings that I, j I just loved the feeling, right? So much so it was like I had a I had a pinky uh, injury where it popped out, and at the end of the season, I I had a, a knee surgery. And they were like, do you want to just clean up the pinky? And I was like, yeah, fuck it. And the the main reason was like I I, I want to have the morphine at the end, and. I, I have never had the desire to go out and get heroin. I've had never had the desire to recreate that feeling other than just when I have a surgery, I enjoy the morphine. And I, I feel like the the, stig, this, the the stigma behind drugs is you're just going to get hooked. You have to, and, and that is, it can be a byproduct, right? It can be dangerous. Absolutely, I would not advocate otherwise. But I think the way in which we demonize it, 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 it disallows us to educate people on its positive effects because it can be it can be a joyous experience like i, I was like i always tell people it, it find me a closed-minded person that's that's that, that, that does drugs it, it's, it can't happen because you you just experience the world in a very different way and in a very different through a different world uh view and i feel like i've gained so much from drug use i've done hallucinate uh hallucinogens i've done weed alcohol all this stuff but at the end of the day i've never been hooked on anything I've, and, and, and that's not a you know deterrent because people can get hooked on this. I want to emphasize that. But I've had a I've had a very good experience with substances, and I think that it just needs to be marketed in a different way because we've been marketed to by our government. We've been marketed to by people who uh, want nothing but profits and, and 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 have incentive in jailing people for this shit. And I I just, I just think you have to look at what marketing has done in this country in general, and then when you market drugs it's just a recipe for disaster and it has been adrian man you you make me laugh i'm i'm glad you really are doing doing this and you're sharing your story but you all you always emphasize that um i'm not saying that you can't get addicted you always yeah. you always put that in the punchline yeah so uh it's like uh having sex be like it's great but you don't have to say i'm not saying you're not getting addicted you know yeah. so we we're always forced to say that yeah. it's like no shit. Yeah. Anything worth doing, yeah. you can potentially get in trouble with. That's that's, that's life. Yeah. But, but the society has forced us to say that that kind of thing. Yeah. But um, the football thing too is an important one that you were just laying out. That I think, like you were saying, these surgeries that you had right. and this this 
dangerous game that you play, mm -hmm. right? I mean, the goal is to take somebody's head off, obviously. Facts. And and in our society, we're cool with that. We're cool yeah. with uh, mixed martial arts. Um, and um, Boxing. the goal is to take someone's head off. Yeah. But the goal of drug use is not that. It's to right. like uh, feel euphoric and better, but we're not cool with that. Right. Uh, not to say that we should be banning athletics in any kind of way. People should be uh, have the right to enjoy their liberty, their pursuit of happiness. Right. But the the inconsistencies just blows my yeah, mind. I'm like, saying I'm with you. I, I mean, I talked to Joe Joe Rogan, who does this sort of mixed martial arts thing, but yet there is some trepidation about drug use. It's like, what the fuck? You sitting here beating yourself up on a daily <laughs> somebody who is cognitively impaired from the activity that yeah. they're participating in. Right. And not from drug use, but from yeah. getting banged in the head. And yeah. so I'm like, boy, this country, uh, yeah. it, it blows my mind, the inconsistencies. I'm, yeah. I'm 100 percent on board. Uh, I, I want to let these guys ask a couple questions over here. Donnie uh, just walked in. He's wearing the sunglasses right here. He's going to ask a question. Then we'll kick it over to Big T and Billy afterwards. But Donnie has traveled all around the world, taken many drugs, various substances <laughs> in various countries. Uh, it's nice to meet you. You too, uh, Donnie. Two questions. The first is about uh, Xanax. I know on the Joe Rogan podcast, you talked about how you can die from uh, alcohol withdrawals, but I know Xanax is the other drug where you can die if you just quit cold turkey. And to me, it, like that has always seemed like one of the more dangerous ones because you can just build up a tolerance so fast. And then if you just quit on the spot, could have seizures and even die. But do you think there is like still a role for Xanax to treat anxiety, or do you think there are much better ways to do it? Uh, of course, you know, there are people who, uh, first of all, let's take a step back. In order to uh, experience Xanax withdrawal, one has to have, be a chronic user and el escalating doses over extended periods of time. So you have to actually really work. Um, and so that can happen with all of the barbit, all the benzodiazepines, Xanax, uh, Valium, Librium, all of the, the benzodiazepines. Also that can happen with the barbiturates, which we don't use as much. So barbiturates, alcohol, benzodiazepines, the same kind of thing can happen. But um, it requires a lot of work to get to that stage. And once you're at that stage, um, it's relatively easy to wean someone off as long as you know what's going on and you warn the person not to abruptly discontinue their use. Um, and so if we think about like a, whether there is a place for benzos in therapy, of course there are. There are people who are uh, who've been safely maintained and they enjoy their benzos. Um, um, and I, I worry that if somebody somebody had a problem with ben, with benzodiazepine, something like Xanax, so now we should ban Xanax. And we did the same thing with the opioids. And now these opioid pain patients who have been doing well in life now all of a sudden ha are being taken off. They can't get their medication. Some are committing suicide. So if you have these tools, why not make them available? You just have to be responsible when you do so. And then one more question. When I was living in China, I tried a drug called MCAT. I think it's short for mephedrone, methylcadamine or something like that. Um, I really enjoyed it. I had a positive experience on it. Uh, but then I learned that that same drug, it's like sold legally in some foreign countries as bath salts. Now in the US, most of the stories we've heard involving bath salts involve someone in Florida eating a guy's face off or something like that. Which was not true. And when they did the toxicology, the only thing they found in his system was THC. Yeah, go on. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So that's what yeah. I was wondering. Do you think it's a small that, level too of yeah, THC? Yeah. Wow. So yeah, do you think um those problems in Florida just stem from mental health issues and that bath salts have gotten a bad rap? <laughs> Well, I'm from Florida, so I can't diss Florida too much. Uh, the uh, you know, Florida is Florida, uh, and so uh, <laughs> people are going to be eating faces regardless. <laughs> yeah, so the the issues with that cat, I don't know what happened with that dude. You know, I really don't. That's one isolated case, um, and we can take an isolated case and make whatever story we want out of it. But what I do know is that the cathinones, the drugs that you're talking about, the uh, the, the synthetic cathinones 
didn't play a role. And the synthetic cathinones produce, many of them produce, uh, I wrote about this in, in my book, uh, doing these drugs in, in uh, Barcelona. Many of them produce effects like MDMA. Shorter lived, but many of the effects are like MDMA. In some cases, uh, like hexadrone is like um, cocaine's effects, and which, uh, but it lasts longer than cocaine's effects. And so I, I talked about this in the book. Um, I'm a fan of the cathinones, so. Same here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Donnie. Yeah. yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah. Billy, you got a question? My question's regarding uh, your talk about the psychedelic renaissance and not wanting to call, you know, say these drugs are good, those drugs are bad. But I want to uh, hear your thoughts about like the very de varying degrees of addiction a drug can cause and how is there actually any merit to psychedelics helping people with alcohol addictive disorder and or if is it like if you have an addictive personality or genetics in your system where you shouldn't try drugs at all or are psychedelics just as addictive as those other drugs yeah so the first thing we have to do is take a step back um the thing the first thing people should know is that the vast majority of users of any drugs from heroin to cocaine to psilocybin, the vast majority of users of any drug are not addicted and they won't become addicted. So that's number one. If that tells you that the majority of the users of a drug do not become addicted, then you can't blame the drug. You have to look beyond the drug when you do see addiction. Mm -hmm. And then you have to think about, so what do we, what is, what do we define as addiction in medicine? So addiction is defined as like the social disruption of psychosocial functioning, if you will. So like uh, people not going to work, people uh, missing their family obligations, people putting themselves in harm's way when they take the drug. So there's a number of symptoms that the person must endorse. And the person must also report being distressed or impaired by those symptoms. And then when you have those two components, then you can you have someone who meets criteria for addiction. So that's what addiction is. Now, when we think about. So real quick, I, to, addiction in, in itself isn't necessarily a an objective black and white thing. Is that what is that what you, is that what I'm, I'm hearing yeah, correctly? There's not a biological sort of uh substrate or a uh, marker of addiction okay um in, instead you know a clinician has to do a thorough assessment and making sure that these people have these type of disruptions and this person is distressed by those disruptions gotcha. and that's how you define addiction gotcha. okay so now we think about like okay are there biological markers of addiction no not although mm. people will say all kinds of nonsense Ask people to show you the data that support that. But that doesn't mean that addiction ain't very real because it is. There are people who experience real problems. But the, the real issue is that you need to do this assessment to see what's going on in this person's life. Like, for example, you can imagine uh, someone being subjected to chronic unrealistic expectations. Like, I don't know, a a child who was a, a star and they supported their whole family and they were always expected to do that. Now the money is kind of drying up because they are not so cute, whatever the case may be. You can understand that person might have some problems in life. Mm -hmm. um, someone who um, had a, a middle class income, made six figures, put, uh, was put in their family through college and now the jobs are gone. Um, um, you can think about the middle of the country, uh, the jobs they left, and you can see the problems that people might have. So you have to look at all of that situation. But what the country is so comfortable in doing is saying, oh, it's opioids. Oh, it's this drug. And then that way we don't have to deal with all the problems that people mm -hmm. face. Um, and, 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 and we fall for it every time. So follow up question to that. So let's say someone drinks too much, drinks repeatedly every day, you know, loses their job. They have a drinking problem. It's, it's, you know, maybe, you know, it, it, whatever issue it is, they then, so if addiction, as you're saying, is almost uh, not a, like a real, not, not saying it's not a real thing, but more of a symptom of a mental health issue or an uh, environmental issue, would that person, do you believe, be able to cure themselves of whatever that situation is and then 
responsibly drink again? Oh, absolutely. I mean, there are data showing that people, well, I they not necessarily cure themselves, but they may have gotten help and they and they figured it out uh, with the help of th a therapist or what have you, and they, they drink now. So this notion that like uh, once an alcoholic, uh, you, you can't drink because it's a downhill spiral. Again, there is no evidence to like really support that, but that's in the public sort of consciousness uh -huh. as it's a real thing. Now, I want to be clear. People who had a drinking problem and decided not to drink because they don't want to risk it, that's great. I'm not saying that you should go out and drink. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that the sort of support for that notion is almost non-existent in terms of the scientific literature. That's what I'm saying. Huh. So, so like a lot of what the stuff that, you know, Al-Anon and 12-step program preaches, you fundamentally disagree with. Uh, I have to tell you, like the, the, the AA model yeah. and so forth, it's really good um, uh, be, in the one hand because people get a chance to interact with other people. Yeah. You know, you need these social connections, and I think it provides that. But the stuff that they say about drug use itself, now that's a whole nother story. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Okay. No, but not that it doesn't work, but just like you believe that like people can drink again after that's very interesting. Uh, uh, yeah. of course. You it Yeah, just imagine somebody I, I think like sex and having an orgasm, there are people who have problems. They they yeah. they overdo it. And then it's like saying, well, I'm sorry, you can't have another orgasm because you get too crazy. You know, come on. That's, that's, actually, that's actually so interesting. That, that's Thank a, you so much for that. It's an interesting point because, yeah, people do go to treatment for sex addiction. And part of that treatment is not like, okay, you're never going to fuck again. Exactly. <laughs> like that's not, they don't, they don't tell you that. You don't get a chip for, okay, I've been six months without fucking. Yeah. So we, we are allowed to spend, suspend our reality when it comes to drugs. Uh, and that's a bad thing, uh, but we do it in our movies, our comedians. I mean, just from from here on out, when you guys watch a movie and there's a drug involved, you will see that the director or the writer never has to develop that character. They'll just say something and you are supposed to believe it. And you oftentimes do. Mm. A comedian, Dave Chappelle, is really widely known for talking about uh, crack and Tyrone, this bullshit. And the society believes it. But what actually is happening is that he's reinforcing the awful stereotypes about a group of people. That is does not comport with reality. And but people believe this nonsense. It's it's interesting. I had never thought of that, that it, if you watch a movie and a character does a line of coke in one scene, it's always in your head like, okay, well, this, this guy's a coke addict and he has a problem. Not understanding that there are millions of people who casually use cocaine, that it doesn't change their entire... That's not who they are as a person. But it's definitely... Now that I think about it, it's, I think that's very true. Um, Big T, I want to be respectful of your time, too. We had you until 1.45. You no, know, so. I'm enjoying this. I okay. mean, you all got me talking now, and I'm in, I'm at home. So. All right. Love it. I just want to make sure you're cool with it. Um, Big T, you have a question for Dr. Uh, yeah. So I, I haven't read your book yet. I want to. Um, but I listened to a lot of interviews you've done. And one question I wanted to ask was about the opioid crisis. I know you, you disagree with that uh, phrasing. Um. I don't want to use the word dismissive because that sounds harsher than I intend it, but you've you've been critical of that uh, you know narrative, I guess. Um, so I'm just curious what you would say about that and the the causes or you know just your overall thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I wish I could be as careful as you phrase your question and that's how you should do it. Um, and I, and so you remind me to be patient uh, when <laughs> responding. So thank you. Um, so you are absolutely right. I have been suspicious and critical of the stories, and I'll tell you why. So one of the things that we do in the country is we show this number, like the number of drug overdoses is a hundred thousand. And then we imply that they're all opioids for the most part, but then it's all drugs. Uh, and then then you then you think about, okay, how are we counting this? 
and then you have to take a step back and this is where it gets this is where people have to read the book and just so you'll see what's happening and but i'll try my best to explain it so the people who count uh, drug overdoses typically are medical examiners and coroners Medical examiners are physicians who have about four years of postdoc training in forensic pathology. Coroners are people from your community who've been elected as coroners. They can be the local sheriff, like in California, in many of the counties, the, the coroner is the sheriff. They can be the funeral home director. They can be someone else. They typically have like a high school diploma and they were elected. Now, um, you have what you think is a drug overdose. Someone is dead. That's a fact. Now, um, how do you know the drug caused the overdose? Um, our, the way we do it, there are no national standards. So uh, when you have a drug overdose, uh, the recommendation is that you do an autopsy. Uh, the majority of these, there are no autopsy done. Well, you do an autopsy because uh, if you don't, you're going to be wrong in about 30% of the cases, right? Um, I'll just give you an example. When George Floyd was killed uh, in uh, uh, 2020, uh, the original, even, even when they did an autopsy, the original autopsy report said he died because of an overdose. Basically, drugs played a role in his death is what they said. And then the public saw the video. And then the public was like, what? Uh, and then the, uh, the diagnosis kind of changed or, uh, um, um, or the diagnosis was modified. But uh, it just goes to show an important point. Uh, one, um, autopsy reports even are altered uh, in order to conceal things that we w don't want to keep from the public, like police violence in this case. Uh, that's, that's, one, that's one thing. Another thing is that when people die and they have a drug in their bodies, a lot of folks have multiple drugs in their system. Do we know which drug caused it, if any? No, because oftentimes we don't even take the levels to determine whether or not the drug rise to what we might consider toxicity. Um, and so when you think about all of the people who are doing, uh, writing up the, uh, the death certificate, these folks who have limited education, there are no national standards. Um, I am suspicious about what's going on uh, because if the story is they're dying from, uh, I don't know, fentanyl, that's a, that's a popular story, um, uh, then supposedly people didn't know they had fentanyl. And, uh, and they thought they had heroin or something. Well, if that's the case, that's an easy fix. All you have to do is make sure the community has these things we call drug checking centers, where they can submit small samples of their drug and then get a printout of everything that's contained in the drug. If it contains a potential toxin, you don't take it or you take smaller amounts. That's really easy. They do this in Austria, Barcelona, Switzerland, Colombia, all around the globe. But we claim to be so concerned about the opioid problem and not have this basic measure if we think this is related to the problem. So that's uh, uh, another reason that I'm suspicious of what's going on because it's not that complicated. Drugs are, put it this way, in my research, we give these drugs to people in the lab every day uh, because of you, the taxpayers. Um, and not only in our labs, but also in other universities. And you don't have any of these kind of problems. We give opioids, we give opioids sometimes in combination with other drugs. Um, and you don't have any of these kind of problems that we're having out here in the, not, in the, in the, in the real world. So if that's the real problem, it's an easy fix. I got a kind of a follow up question. For if if there's no national standards and I just looked it up, and I didn't know that that's crazy. There's no national standards for like uh, causes of death and the reasons as to why I had no idea. Probably get, um, like different different tolerance levels, too, for people that, well, no, that sure. might make it more difficult. Yeah, sure. But what I'm saying, the, the broader point, I think, is is 
what data can we go by to trust? Because I, I, I think a lot of the times like that, that kind of issue spurs legislation that's harmful. Right. Mm -hmm. And so if. If we don't have a I mean, that should be a pressing issue for any legislator to say we need to tighten up standards of causes of death so that we can get accurate data so that we can have accurate reasons as to why people are dying. And 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 so I have I have not. That's why I said this is the first time I've heard that. Like, has there been any kind of push from I always feel like this, too. Let me, let me go on a little science like has a branding problem like I, I really think science has a branding problem because they like you guys are the smartest motherfuckers on earth but a lot of the times people don't know how to take that brilliance and put it in a paddle palatable way that people understand it and so a lot of this issue i see is is like those are the kinds of legislative things that i would absolutely vote for um but these are not the kind of things that you know are are marketed to us as to why what politicians uh, care about but this would actually help so much stuff so have you have you seen any kind of lobbying or or legislative pushes to to help that specific issue Man, you know it's it's wow you picked right up on the major point yeah that's this is the issue and so i wrote about this in the last book drug use for grown-ups and so you talk about science having this sort of marketing issue it's it, to some extent you're right but you know like my first book high price um it was love. I got a lot of press, a lot of love. This book um, um, sold a lot more, but there was a lot more haters. <laughs> but information like this is in that book. Hmm. And I've been out here saying this, but the thing is, um, I think that there are a lot of people who don't want to hear what I have to say, particularly as it relates to people enjoying those freedoms right and so you want to discredit me the messenger and then you just throw the message all out right. and so i think like the uh, there is a slight marketing problem but then there is active discrediting got you um you know you all can just search the internet and the bullshit that's been written about me right. you know i'm an i'm an old guy but and then people have said things like oh but you know, he's privileged. You know, I grew mm. up in the hard hood. I had a son who spent time in prison, right. but I'm privileged. You know, stupid right. shit like that. People right. say things uh, to discredit the messenger, but the message, it's there. Right. It's all it's all there. Interesting. So um, I, my, my last question to you would be uh, about something you said earlier in this interview, which was that you're tired. You're tired of like, because you've been. You, it must feel like you've been banging your head against the wall making this, you know. Your, I feel like I'm gonna be mission. you in 20 years. That's that's where I'm going to be. I'm like, oh, fuck, fuck it. Who gives a fuck these people? Right. That's what <laughs> I, I I can understand how you believe in something so very deeply, and you've got studies that you've done, and here's the data, and some people just won't look at it. And people are dying. And people are dying. Yeah, mm. people are dying. So it's actually like it, you could be you could be helping a lot of people. People would listen to you. Are there things that you've done over your, the, the years that you've been making this push that you look back and you're like, that's progress that we've made. I'm happy with the results of this. Some of the other stuff might feel like I'm just screaming into the void and nobody's listening to me, but what, what have you been able to do that you, you can actually point back to and be like, I'm very proud that my influence helped move things forward. Oh, there's a lot, you know, to be proud of, but the thing is, it's like when you are in the fight, um it's like you're in the battle and then you're like oh we we did okay but but you're still in the battle so you still might be taken out so you can't really enjoy that mm -hmm. and so but there's a lot i mean like we're, we have this national conversation people ask people to get out of the closet about their drug use a number of people have gotten out of the closet about their drug use a lot more people are more comfortable saying that they've done a psychoactive drug uh people have had to i mean i don't know if you guys know burning man that big festival yeah, yeah. uh so like going to spaces like that which uh, caused me a lot of stress but going to spaces like that uh speaking to people who live out loud in a place like burning man you know they they do a lot of things that they don't do here in their regular life and so i'm asking people why not live like you want to in your entire life and so i think there are people who are trying to do that trying to live 
like they want to live in at Burning Man out here. Um, and that means that you let other people live like they want to live. And so I think that uh, people are hearing that message and I'm proud of that. Um, of course, I'm proud of the people who my children um, have become and are becoming because they see their father out here um, fighting. And this is part of our legacy in this country mm -hmm. is being African-Americans uh, standing up when, when something is wrong. And despite the consequences to me, you know, it's like uh, you still have an obligation to do that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so I, my, I'm proud that my kids get mm -hmm. to see this. And from a, a legislative standpoint, have you seen anything moving in, in the direction that you'd like it to move? I know that they, they have changed some laws to make it more equitable because for a while crack cocaine was punished um, that's a, a one huge, piece of legislation that I, I would like because they always say Obama, yeah. Obama doesn't do nothing for black folks. That's I mean, low bar. That's that's the one thing I always point to is like the Fair Sentencing Act. It's like it's it's a low like, but he did he did help usher that legislation. So in, we should say it. something about this one, the crack thing. So crack cocaine violations were punished a hundred times more harshly than mm -hmm. powder cocaine violations. And the real concern too was that. Uh, and black people made up more than 80% of those people prosecuted under that law, mm -hmm. meaning they, they were more likely to go to jail for a mandatory minimum sentence of five years. And in 2010, uh, the law changed to such that crack is now punished 18 times more harshly than powder cocaine. Even though uh, the sentencing commission and every sort of responsible commission said that they should be punished equally. So in effect, Obama uh, compromised this away when he said that he was going to equate it. Yeah. Um, so it's still not right. Right. And black people still represent 80 percent of the people who are convicted under that law. Right. Um, and so and that one disappoints me a lot right. uh, related to him. Um, and but I think about some successes, I think about Oregon they decriminalize all drugs. I think about um, what's happening with cannabis uh, around the nation. Uh, people, we have legal cannabis in some states and it's becoming more of a thing. Uh, of course, it'd be nice to see other drugs be seen this way, but there have been victories. And, um, uh, and I guess you have to celebrate victories when you're in battle, otherwise, uh, yeah, you may go crazy. Yeah. It's All right. Facts. Well, thank you very much for stopping by. Appreciate you Appreciate coming, it. brother. Yeah. Big fan, fan. Yeah. This thank is this is fascinating. So, thank you and uh and good luck in the future. We hope to talk to you again. Thank you guys for having me. Thanks, man. Pleasure, yeah. brother. Pleasure.